sometimes I think Chris was probably hitchhiking. Probably looking to get away somewhere. And he just probably stopped for her. She's by herself. She could have met him at a gas station while he's filling up. Can you give me a lift? But somewhere along the lines, I think he was giving her a ride someplace. I don't think she had any indication what was about to happen to her. Chris was very trusting. So, you know, that was her downfall. My sister, Christine, was born Christine Ruth Thornton, um, but we always called her Chris. She was 11 years older than me. Chris was tall. She was, she was 5 foot 10, dark hair, dark eyes, just, you know, a beautiful person inside and out. In the summer of 77, Chris was just 27 years old. Chris was in San Antonio. She was pregnant at the time. Christine was a um, free spirit. Uh, she kind of went where the wind blew her. She met up with her boyfriend and, you know, had this crazy idea of going to Montana to pan for gold. And my understanding is that they were in southwest Wyoming and had an argument ensued between the two of them. And he left her pregnant and alone. And I believe that's the last time any, anybody had ever seen her. In the summer of 78, I decided to go down to San Antonio and do some investigating of my own. I actually tried to find her boyfriend, but did not have a good address for him. The San Antonio police refused to take a missing persons report on Chris because she was an adult. I believe throughout all the years that Christine was missing, I think Kathy was always looking for a way to open up that door of where she is. In 82, this uh, herder out in the middle of nowhere comes across uh, a pile of bones, obviously human remains. What they found was it was a body of a 25 to 35 year old female. Along with her bones were also uh, bones of an infant. There wasn't any identification, and so it remained cold for, for many years. And investigators never imagined that those bones would lead them to a notorious serial killer, a man I would later be called upon to prosecute. And this photograph, discovered by police, would lead a heartbroken family to their loved one, missing for almost 40 years. Her smile shared by a tragic list of young women and girls who trusted a charming stranger, only to discover a dark secret that began back in the fall of 1968. So 68 was um, tumultuous. It was sort of flower power, reliving. It was quite a era and quite a year. Martin Luther King, Robert F. Kennedy have been assassinated. Andy Warhol is shot that year. And there have been urban uprisings throughout the 60s. <laughs> Being a police officer in Los Angeles or any, anywhere in the country, for that matter, at that time, everything was anti-war, anti-establishment. And it's commented on by some of the you know, leading vocalists of the day. You had Barry McGuire in 1965 doing Eve of Destruction. The Eastern world, it is exploding. You had Bob Dylan, of course, doing A Hard Rain's Gonna Fall. A hard rain is gonna fall. So what we're seeing is the influence of the new freedoms represented by the counterculture be appropriated by mainstream culture. And that includes daytime television. That even includes game shows like The Dating Game. The Dating Game began um, with Chuck Barris back in, uh, I believe it was 1965. He had dealings with ABC and he just came up with the idea and he, he pitched it to a couple of people. It caught on right away. The premise was the female asking questions of 
three bachelors who sat on the other side of a partition. She wasn't able to see them, of course, and she picked one for a date, and then she met the guy that she had picked, and they were awarded a date. Looking back, it is chilling to realize that this iconic show celebrating love and romance would unknowingly feature a remorseless killer. And from the mid-60s onward, Southern California is a mecca for anyone looking to reinvent him or herself and have a fantastic time. They're all partying at some of the hotels on the Strip, like the Chateau Marmont. Tally Shapiro was an eight-year-old little girl who lived at Chateau Marmont, which is a famous hotel in California. Her father was a music industry executive. She had a mother and a sister and a brother. And they were living there because their house had gone on fire, and they were staying there temporarily. And a car pulls up alongside of her. And it's this man who says, well, it's OK, I'm not a stranger. I know your parents. I'm friends with your parents. And she thought, hmm. Well, maybe I'll get in the car. Well, fortunately, a good citizen looks at this and says, I don't like the looks of this. Tali Shapira was eight years old, and it was a beautiful sunny day in September. And this adorable little girl would skip to school each morning, carefree, loving, wearing her little white Mary Janes. And uh, then the horror story of Tally begins. I remember the morning was nice and warm because I wore the dress that my nanny had crocheted for me. And a car pulls up alongside of her. And the man leans out and says, hmm, I have a beautiful picture I'd like to show you. And I guess asked if I needed a ride to school. And I told him I didn't talk to strangers. And he pulled up alongside of her a little further, kept trolling her. And that's when he told me he knew my parents. And I really didn't want to get in the car. Um, but I was raised to respect my elders. I got in the car. That's when he asked what time my school started. And then that's when he realized that we had plenty of time and he was going to swing by and show me a poster. You know, I didn't know to fear people. Well, fortunately, a good citizen looks at this and says, I don't like the looks of this. And he actually follows him to his apartment. The moment I felt danger was when he wanted to go by his place. And I remember wanting to jump out of the car. So the Good Samaritan, he actually followed the car to a residence where the man took the little girl out of the car and walked her inside, and that didn't look right. And he calls the police. He says, you know, this is real hinky looking. I don't like it. There's this little girl. You know, I think you ought to check it out. I don't remember going up to the apartment, and I don't remember anything after that. I was driving down Sunset heading toward West Hollywood when I received a call. Uh, to go see a man about a possible kidnapping. I followed him over to the location. At that time, I thought, OK, I better call in for a backup. So I went and called in and requested a backup unit. I went to the front door and started knocking. Uh, I could hear uh, someone running around. So the man came, and he opened up the curtains a little bit and peered out and said, oh, sorry, I was in the shower. I'll be right there. I see this. Uh, male uh, person on the other side, no clothes, not dripping with water, no towel. And I said, oh, OK, you need to open the door right now. I need to come in. And he said, wait, wait, let me put my pants on. And I said, OK, you got three seconds. I probably waited five seconds, and I kicked the door in. To the right was a dining room. To the left was a living room. And straight ahead was a kitchen. And here was this uh, little girl, blood all over the place, uh, clothes, shoes, and a dress thrown to one side. There was uh, coins on the floor. 
and she had this steel bar across her neck, which probably weighed two pounds. And there's an image that I will never forget. It's an image of this pipe used to, to, to strangle her with, essentially. Press it against her throat, and more blood than should ever be able to come out of a little eight-year-old girl next to these Mary Jane shoes on the floor of this kitchen. I looked at her. I thought she was dead. She wasn't breathing. The other officers came around. We were looking for the suspect. I went back to check on uh, Telly, and I just couldn't leave her there like that. The officer had a, had a sort of a life or death decision to make, chase this man out the back and catch him, or render life-saving aid to the little girl and save her life. And he chose, he chose the little girl. And as I went back in the kitchen, she started gagging, Telly. So then that put everything into high gear. But when I was yelling, the officer that was covering the back door thought I was asking for help. So he ran to the front to help me. Uh, we later found out the suspect escaped through the back door. Telly was bleeding out, literally clinging to life. Fortunately, there was already an ambulance racing to the scene. Tally arrived in the emergency room, and the doctor said there was no chance of saving her. And after she had been taken by the ambulance, they started looking around the apartment to see if there were any clues as to who the person was. I found his ID. He, we determined he was a student at UCLA in the photography department. And the name of the man who attended UCLA was Rodney Alcala. They searched that house, and there are references in reports of hundreds and hundreds of photographs of young women and boys in various stages of dress, in various stages of vulnerability, that were in Rodney Alcala's possession. We had to find this Rodney Alcala. We had to get him off the street, because if he would do that to a little eight-year-old girl, uh, there's no telling what he would do. You know, it was just by, uh, you know, sheer luck that Tally didn't die. She should have died, but she didn't. She was in a coma for 32 days. Nobody thought that she would survive, and miraculously, she pulled through. She was able to get back on her feet after several months in the hospital. My parents mentioned nothing. It was never brought up. It was never spoken about. I remember walking into my classroom and everyone looking at me like I was supposed to be dead. And her parents had just had enough. They could not stay in California another minute. They moved out of the country shortly after that. Uh, they moved to uh, Mexico. Uh, the father wanted to uh, give her a better, uh, safer environment to live in. And that's where they stayed for the next many years. Rodney Alcala has gotten away. And now he's, he's fled, and nobody knows where he's gone. I was police officer with LAPD. This was one of my very first cases, actually. And it was four or five months old at that time. And he was in the wind. I went out and interviewed a number of his professors at UCLA. One of the things they told me is, you know, you got the wrong guy. You know, Rod Alcala is a super guy. He wouldn't hurt a flea. Really nice guy. Police wanted to know who is Rodney Alcala and why would this well-liked 25-year-old college student so viciously attack an eight-year-old little girl? This is San Antonio, Texas, home of the Alamo. Rodney Alcala was born Rodrigo Jacques Alcala Bucor on August 23, 1943, in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, he had an older brother, Raul. Uh, he had an older sister, and then he had a younger sister. His family lived in Mexico for a while. The grandma passed away, and the father left the family. They ended up moving to Los Angeles area, to Monterey Park. He had everything he wanted, Alcala. You know, he went to Catholic schools. He went to, you know, private schools. Everyone who knew him said he was a kind boy, a respectful boy, and highly intelligent. Rodney Alcala had 
every advantage that somebody could have in life. He had a mother who loved him, which is a big deal psychologically. He had friends. He had brothers and sisters who all turned out to be very successful. His older brother was already at West Point. So this is a pretty, you know, patriotic family. And then he joined the Army in the early 60s, and that's where the trouble really began for Rodney O'Connor. So Alcala didn't fare well in the Army. He went AWOL a few times, got in some trouble. As it turns out, this bright, handsome young man with the promising future had nightmarish urges that he refused to ignore. So 1963, he gets a pass in the military. He ultimately goes to New York. While in New York, he assaults a girl. He hits her over the head with a Coke bottle. That girl was able to run away. He had sociopathic personality traits. He, he had no shame, and he didn't you know, feel guilty about anything that he did. The military felt that he had had a nervous breakdown. That was their analysis of it. The psychiatrist at the hospital felt it was a lot more serious than that. But he was discharged honorably, and not a blemish on his record. So he ends up coming back to California, where he enrolls in the UCLA Fine Arts program as a photography major. So Rodney Alcala is actually attending UCLA and living less than a mile away from Chateau Marmont when he attacks Tally Shapiro in 1968, and then seems to vanish. I was pretty much convinced he'd gone to Mexico, because he had relatives in Mexico. So it's been three years now since the rape of Tally Shapiro. The FBI eventually became interested in the case and put Rodney Alcala on the 10 most wanted list. So I get a phone call and it's the FBI in New Hampshire. Say, hey, we've got your guy in custody, Rodney James Alcala. It, it seemed like an open and shut case, but it was just the beginning of what would become a pattern of catch and release that would continue for more than a decade. While the FBI is on the hunt for Rodney Alcala, he's actually living on the East Coast under an assumed name, John Berger. So in 1968, John Berger walks into NYU and applies to their School of the Arts. So there he was in New York, a fugitive, now for three years. What better place to be a sexual predator than to go to a feeding frenzy like New York? So New York in the early 70s is certainly, from the civic standpoint, rather challenged. It's Mayor Lindsay's second term. He's having a hard time delivering services to people. Snow removal, garbage. Police feel like they're under siege. Crime is certainly up, violent crime. And it's during this crime wave in New York City that Alcala is able to fly under the radar, and he strikes again. Cornelia Crilly grew up in Queens. She had two sisters and two brothers, Catholic family, very well respected in the neighborhood, had a very happy childhood. She was beautiful. She had long, beautiful Irish hair and Irish eyes, big smile, very friendly and funny. A few years after high school, uh, Cornelia met dream man, Leon Borstein, and they began dating. I was 29 or 30. She was probably 23 at the time. She wanted to become a TWA stewardess. At that time, they were known as ambassadors to the world and had a lot of prestige. And once she was accepted, she got an apartment with a couple of her stewardess friends on East 83rd Street. In fact, in the east side of Manhattan, an area becomes known as the Girl Belt because for the first time, young women are living on their own and experiencing their careers as they never had in the past. I had gotten a job in, in a Brooklyn DA's office. So in the middle of the day, I got a call from her mother saying she couldn't find her. I said, OK, when I leave, I'll go find her. I'm sure she's at the apartment. Mrs. Crilly was trying to get in touch with her daughter, and she didn't answer the phone. She was living in a building where I could go into the building without a key. I, I knocked on the door, and there was no response. That's when I called the cops. And they came over. I was at the front door when they broke in the back window. They opened the door. They told me that she had been killed. She was down on the floor of her New York apartment. She had been strangled with nylon stockings and also had bite marks on her breast. 
she'd been raped and brutally murdered. We got a call from the police department that somebody still had to identify the body. So I went over to the morgue. The Crilly case, very unique because she had just moved in the apartment. She's a new girl. No one knew her. So that was a drawback to the detectives in the beginning. New York PD has this brutal crime scene and no suspects. We had almost 2,000 murders that year. It wasn't peace, love, and joy. Detectives had a lot of dead ends with this case. They, they, they had nothing, unfortunately, and the case went cold. Well, still enrolled as a student at NYU, Rodney Alcala, AKA John Berger, actually spent his summers as a counselor at an arts camp in New Hampshire. So in August of 1971, two campers take the little dirt road down to the post office, and all of a sudden it starts pouring. They run inside the post office to get cover, and they start looking around to see what is in the post office. And there's the good old FBI 10 most wanted list. They go from one to the next to the next. Each one looks more horrible than the preceding one. Look at this, and they're like, hey, that's Mr. Berger. So they go back to the camp and they tell the head counselor, we saw this 10 most wanted poster of somebody who looks like our John Berger. So he said, don't say anything to anyone and I'll go down to the post office and take a look. So he comes back, he calls the FBI, and he says, I think we have your man. I get a phone call and it's the FBI in New Hampshire. Say, hey, we've got your guy in custody, Rodney James Alcala. I said, you've got him in custody, fantastic. This has been three years that Alcala has been on the lam and that Hodel has been looking for him. So uh, on the 12th of August, 1971, I, uh, with a partner, picked him up, took him to the airport, flew him back. We got our guy, you know, he's going to prison for at least 20, 30 years. Parents didn't want Tally to testify. I said, it would be too traumatic. So I think the big fear was, oh my god, you know, will Alcala get away with it? And what's dangerous in the case of a sociopath is they're very persuasive. In 1971, Rodney Alcala is arrested in New Hampshire and brought back to LA to finally face charges for the rape and attempted murder of Tally Shapiro. He was very low key, kind of came off a bit introverted, but I could see his, his mind functioning. And that's what made this guy so dangerous. He was able to read people very well and stay a step or two or three ahead of them. For him, it was all a, a kind of a chess game. Rodney Alcala is charged with all the crimes against Tally Shapiro, which included kidnapping, rape, child molestation, and torture. It turns out that because Tally and her family were in Mexico, the only charge they could put on him was a plea deal for child molestation. No brutality, no bashing, no raping, no almost killing. And they wound up giving Rodney Alcala a plea deal where he pled to what's known as an indeterminate sentence. He had one year to life in California State Prison. With an indeterminate sentence, it's sliding. It's not determined. And then the parole board has more flexibility in determining whether someone's been rehabilitated or whether they're a danger to the community. This meant that Rodney Alcala would have yearly parole reviews. And what's dangerous in the case of a sociopath is they're very persuasive and he's getting therapy in prison, and they believe that he has shown enough progress that in 34 months, the California Parole Board released Rodney Alcala back into the world. Not even three years. Good behavior, they said. Model prisoner, they said. And he was out on the streets again. The heartbreaking part about this is that they could have kept him, but in those days, that was an era where they believed so strongly in the power of therapy but when it comes to fixing psychopaths, it doesn't work. So Alcala is the luckiest man in the world. He's out on parole, and he's having the best time. He's photographing people, and he one day decides to take a ride, and he starts trolling again. True to form, two months later, Rodney Alcala is caught smoking marijuana on the cliffs of Sunset Beach in Huntington Beach with a 13-year-old girl. And he was caught by park rangers. So he gets arrested yet again. 
And this time, he gets two and a half years, and he's taken to prison. In June 1977, Rodney Alcala is released again from California State Prison, and he goes in, a uh, different parole officer this time, and he asks for permission to go on some vacations. And the parole officer miraculously says, sure, go ahead. So Rodney heads off to New York. July 1977 in New York was a difficult time for everyone. It was hot, it was steamy, the garbage wasn't being collected. When you used to read the newspaper, Daily News or the Post, the first 20 pages are just violence, 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 every day. There were a lot of murders going on, including Son of Sam. During the time of Son of Sam in 1977, the city was afraid. Look, you had a lunatic running around, shooting men and women in cars. Police in New York are on special alert tonight for a psychopathic killer who calls himself Son of Sam. His favorite targets, young white women with long, dark hair. During that time, Alcala is taking a lot of photographs. He walks up and down the streets and asks people if he can take their picture. Young boys, older boys, young girls, older women, doesn't matter, he just wants to take photographs. And a young woman says, sure, you can take my photograph. And they start talking and they get along, it's very nice. Her name is Ellen Hover. Ellen was strikingly beautiful. She had long, dark hair and long, slender arms and legs and carried herself like a dancer. Her father was the owner of Ciro's in Hollywood, a well-known nightclub where Sammy Davis Jr. and Dean Martin and her other people appeared. Ellen was very trusting of other people. She came from a Hollywood family, grew up in Beverly Hills, and then Great Neck, and then Manhattan. Ellen loved people. On July 13th and 14th was the famous New York City blackout. This is an ABC News special report. New York City went totally dark last night, and tonight large parts of the city still are without power. It's lawlessness. People loot, crime goes through the roof, you know, people are afraid. There's no refrigeration, no water, no lights on one of the hottest, steamiest nights of the year in New York City. It was a very unsettling, hard time for most people. On July 15th, Ellen Hover goes missing. That evening, friends tried to get in touch with Ellen. Nobody could. The phone rang. It was Ellen's mother, Yvonne Schwartz. Mrs. Schwartz asked me if I had heard from Ellen since the weekend. And I said, no. The next thing I knew, I was watching the 11 o'clock news, and there was Ellen's picture, New York heiress missing. And the next day, when the police showed up at her door, they looked inside, and they found on her calendar there was an entry that said she was meeting John Berger. Ellen Hover's disappearance was a huge mystery. This was a very big deal, that this socialite, this young woman, was just gone, missing. There was nothing in her background that suggested that she would have run away. It's in the New York Times. It's on posters. It's on the news. It's the talk of the town. When the police showed up at her door, they looked inside. Nothing looks like an attack happened there, but they collect evidence and mail, notes, things like that. And one of the things they take is, is her calendar. And there was an entry that said she was meeting John Berger. They research back, and they, they try to ID who John Berger is. You're talking about a woman who goes missing in New York City pre-computer. And so Rodney Alcala slash John Berger was never really on the radar of the New York City Police Department. So Alcala goes back to LA, and he's there actually trying to find a job. Rodney Alcala gets a job with the Los Angeles Times working as a, as a typeset. You have to put this into perspective. On the lam for three years, 10 most wanted, two stints in jail, felon. He applies under his own name, Rodney Alcala, and he gets the job. 
He actually would bring in photographs to show some of the people at his work. A lot of the photos were of nude girls. And I think it was like the time when people didn't really question it. You weren't like, oh my God, you're a pedophile. Like instead they were like, oh, he's just kind of strange. You know, he's very artsy. So five months after, I'll call it, his return to L.A., the FBI is actually able to connect the dots between Rodney Alcala, the name John Berger, and the notes found in Ellen Hover's calendar. So Rodney Alcala was eventually questioned by the FBI in relation to the disappearance of Ellen Hover, and he admitted being with her. Where did you meet Ellen on the uh, 15th? He said he had taken her up to uh, Westchester to take a picture. They had a lovely time, and that was it. Never saw her again. I think he'd be called, like, dropping her off. That was it. At that point, they still had not found a body. Other than him admitting to the crime, saying, I killed her, there wasn't enough to arrest him. This is Bill McCreary in North Tarrytown with a story about the discovery of the body of a millionaire's daughter missing for the past 11 months. Ultimately, she's found. It's almost a year later. She's found up in an area by the Rockefeller Estate. They found clothing of hers nearby. They went back to the same site, and they discovered her remains. But it's all skeletal. She's identified through a dental comparison. Well, police are able to positively identify the remains of Ellen Hover, there is no forensic evidence that leads them to her killer. 1970s was considered a serial killer central. You have the Hillside Strangler, the Night Stalker, two freeway killers. You have the Bedroom Basher. Elsewhere, you have Ted Bundy and John Wayne Gacy killing people in Chicago. Recently, there's been a rash of mass murders. 1977 through 1978, many women were murdered. Police in this era are lacking a lot of the investigative tools they have today. There's no DNA. There's no surveillance camera around every corner. People aren't walking around with a GPS in their pocket. All of these things lead to this sort of perfect storm for Rodney Alcala, where he's able to remain one step ahead of police, and he goes on the hunt for more victims, and there's absolutely nothing to stop him. Jill Barkham was a 19-year-old girl in New York who was adventuresome and wanted to take a trip with a friend of hers. And so she left New York for Los Angeles. Jill and I were very close as children growing up. We were often mistaken as twins. Jill had a very free spirit about her. Bruce was very sad when she left New York. Uh, was very scared for her, being so young at 19 years old. So November 10th, 1977, I called home, and there was crying in the background. They said, you, you need to come home. You need to come home. And that's all they would say. Jill Barkham was found off of Franklin Canyon Road, and it was down the street from Marlon Brando's home at the time. She was found bent over, half naked. Her head was facing the dirt. She has multiple ligatures on her neck. It was a brutal crime scene. I came into a house of, of uh, siblings distraught, righteously so, and heard it from my mother directly that my sister was dead. Her face was unrecognizable. Her brother said at the funeral that he couldn't even recognize his sister. Uh, it was so mutilated. I had night terrors uh, the day that Jill's body arrived. It wasn't just murder, it wasn't just rape, it was, it was brutal, it was sadistic. And nobody could understand why the things happened to her. They thought perhaps this could be the work of the Hillside Strangler because that's what the Hillside Strangler did. Strangle women and left them on the side of the road. And it complicated this investigation because Jill Barkham had a, had a friend when she got out to LA that was actually abducted and murdered by the Hillside Strangler. In the end, the police were unable to link the murder of Jill Barcom to the Hillside Strangler, and the case just went cold. That meant the string of murders of young girls and women continued. Georgia Wickstead was 27 years old. She was absolutely gorgeous. She was a nurse that worked for cardiac care. 
She was from Los Angeles. She worked out of the Sentinella Hospital and just recently moved to Malibu. Every morning she would pick up another nurse and they would drive to the hospital together to do their shift. And one morning, she didn't show up. So the police uh, were called to do a welfare check of her in her home. It was discovered that her window was open and the screen was removed. When the police entered her home, there was blood everywhere. Her body was completely naked and strewn on the floor, kind of posed open. The viciousness and the sadism involved in her murder is so disturbing and so profound. There was a handprint that was found on the brass bedding, but there was no one to match the palm print to. And again, that case went cold. And the third person who was found dead in the same way as the other two was Charlotte Lamb. Charlotte Lamb, in 1978, was a legal secretary living in the Santa Monica area. She had called some friends one night to go out and go dancing in Santa Monica. Her friends decided not to go. Her body was later found in El Segundo, miles away, in an apartment complex she had no connection to. She had been um, strangled and she'd been brutally raped and murdered. Her arms had been folded behind her back, which made her back arch to expose her breasts. She'd been posed. It's just uh, very disturbing and incredibly sad. I met with Rodney five or six times. I administered assessments with regard to his sexual interests. Many times, the rapist, killer, uh, antisocial person will pose dead bodies, and they do want uh, law enforcement and other people to see this. And there's a message in that. The message for Rodney is that I am here, you will remember me. So instead of hiding in the shadows, Rodney Alcala is almost fearless, and he puts himself out there in perhaps the most public way possible. Rodney going on the dating game is a great example of him being predatory, him being confident, narcissistic, and of course, he wouldn't go on unless he would win. And five, four, three. He always wins. Baxter number one is a successful photographer. He might find him skydiving or motorcycling. Please welcome Rodney Alcala. Yeah. 